Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Chauncey Friend and we're here today to talk about augmented reality and visualization. Uh, I work in the UITS Advanced Visualization Lab and my slides won't advance. There we go. Okay, I'll come back to that. So the lab I work for is a UITS group. Uh, we, we've been around for about 21 years or so now and What's exciting about our group is we're always evolving in terms of visualization research support. And of course at IU, we do a lot of create, creative activity support, but I'm gonna focus a little less on creative activity support and a little bit more on just scientific visualization and visualization in general, using augmented reality as a tool today. Um, the context, I guess, for the history of our organization is we started quite a while ago in Bloomington with some like kind of flagship virtual reality systems. So VR was, a first class citizen for a long time um, in the lab and augmented reality is actually kind of new for the lab as far as support goes. Uh, what's great about kind of growing with the university is you get different requests and you start to realize there's different areas you didn't uh, support. So we, we spread out support and we've gone into all sorts of areas. Our first decade was all about the flagship facilities and then we've gone into distributed visualization uh, type projects. That would be an example would be this IQ wall, for instance. This is built by uh, Chris Eller. He's sort of the local IU integrator for this, working with many different vendors. And uh, there's almost 20 of these around different campuses across IU. Um, I think he's up to 19 now. Tomorrow he's putting one more in at IUPUI. <laughs> That's exciting. And then now we're starting to really look at increasing utilization. So augmented reality plays a role big time with this considering that you know there there really are no flagship facilities for augmented reality i can think of i mean a hololens would be the closest thing that's a multi-thousand dollar headset that you can wear it's not really as big of an investment as some of these other virtual reality things but you know mobile devices are leading the way so we're seeing folks bring their own devices so software support is playing much more of a role with ar and that's most of the time i spend supporting researchers is in helping them get their workflows completed so our goals for today are just to kind of get acquainted with AR, some basic stuff. If you guys have already started working with AR, this will be a little bit of review, some history, um, how I sort of in, introduce AR into folks' lives as far as using it in their work, um, if they're a technology person or not. And then how do, how do we make our own AR and, and how do we be smart about that? And then of course, we'll talk about the different platforms that are available now in what, September of 2018, it'll be different next month. It's very quick. Uh, fundamental forms, how I kind of break down a few different uh, technologies within AR in terms of tracking systems, and then some sort of future facing concepts in term, terms of tracking systems, subsystems, and, uh, and then I'll have some resources for you at the end. So uh, the role we play at the university, like I said, isn't necessarily to build big augmented reality contraptions for you to come use like we do with VR. It's, it's more about actually just having workshops available right now because people are dabbling and using it in more sophisticated, sophisticated ways and less sophisticated ways. So it's just a bad matter about spreading the word as far as our kind of core unit understands AR and, and, and supports it. And then I, I document only key workflows through mostly video tutorials. So if I get, you know, within a year's time, say four requests or two requests for the same concept that isn't obviously available through uh, a popular augmented reality tool, let's say like Vuforia, um, I might go ahead and spend the time to spin out a, a workflow and build a video documentation on this and then publish it for the world, you know, not just IU. And then kind of just break the, the thing that's slowing everybody up. Uh, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one consulting, of course, and I really have to ask people right away when you're working with augmented reality is why, you know, why do you need to augment data into the real world? You know, why can't you just make it, make it a simpler problem and solve it with just displaying it on a screen or using virtual reality, you know, augmented reality is often used because it's cool and that's fine for marketing purposes. That's completely fine. And of course there are others, you know, getting students, young students engaged in technology. I understand all that. Um, but when you're working with research, sometimes it's not necessary to use AR. Um, so you have to ask some hard questions and yeah, I'll talk about some available systems for you now. So from the academic perspective, this is where we're talking about, you know, why exactly do we need augmented reality? So the, the thing people can agree on academically with say VR and AR is this continuum, this 
kind of derived from Milgram's continuum, which was described a little bit more um, abstract in the early 90s. But I'm going to just lay this all out there because I think people can agree that if you have a line and on the left side say it's the real world and on the right side you have the synthetic world or virtual world, virtual reality, um, in the middle somewhere you're blending together some ratio of the real world and, and the, the fake world or computer graphics world, if you will. And then you have augmented reality. And there's a lot of terms out there. There's mixed reality, there's augmented virtuality. And a lot of these come from commercial development. So Microsoft is not saying augmented reality for their HoloLens device. And to Microsoft, this is a mixed reality platform. And some academics will follow along with that because they've been publishing on mixed reality for years and years. And they'll have a distinction saying, Oh, it, it makes sense to call it mixed reality because it, it's taking more of an understanding of the real world and playing a role instead of just like what they would consider lesser you know, applications being just overlaying content over the real world. It, it's a big debate. It seems like Pepsi, Coke, you know, when I get around uh, academic crowds, it just we talk about what is mixed reality, what is augmented reality. And it seems like everybody's got a, a way to describe it. It's not a big deal because I think at the end of the day, we can sort of agree on this continuum here and maybe mixed reality fits in somewhere else but not immediately not immediately clear to me it doesn't really matter but this is really the question I mean, not really the question but sort of the statement you have to make when you're building augmented reality is are you putting what matters where it matters so that actually was IU's slogan a few years ago it's on big red two on the front of the supercomputer it says what matters where it matters and like Augmented reality, great. Okay, so a brief history. Um, this is from my perspective, quite honestly. So AR was something I did as a student for fun and it developed into something I supported in the lab as I, as I ventured into the AVL. Uh, so the term was first kind of described in 1901 in the master key. This was of course before computing is what it is or what it was and you know, Ivan Sutherland was like this, this kind of maven in head mounted display technology at the University of Utah, and he created what's called the ultimate display. Um, that's a picture there of it, the top. And moving on, AR Toolkit was a, one of the first tools I tried to use. I was not a strong C++ programmer, but that was the original language that that tool was in. Um, so that was in the late 90s. And then Vuforia came out, so that's a plug-in that was developed initially by Qualcomm, now is owned by an engineering company called PTC, and that's very popular. Uh, and then Google introduces Google Glass. That was a really successful marketing campaign, but not really that successful of a platform, but it brought augmented reality into the kind of the enterprise crowd's terminology. And then of course, Niantic, when they brought Pokemon Go out, brought the word or the, the term augmented reality sort of out into the zeitgeist of everyone. So most people can tell you what augmented reality is thanks to that video game. And then the HoloLens came out in 2015. There's a lot more history of AR, but those are the main ones that stick out of my brain. Um, I actually have lifted this chart from our virtual reality support talk, and it really does apply to AR as well. So this is actually pretty important moving forward with this talk. There's three main use cases that you can kind of point to for augmented reality, and this simplifies the support end of things and how you design it. So the simplest and easiest use of augmented reality is finding a pre-existing application that already exists, say a mobile device app or an app off the window store for the HoloLens and data that's already in the app. So basically this is a totally created for you experience. That's really what it is, it's just an experience that you're, you're borrowing and using and, and maybe just integrating into a, a teaching curriculum. And that's the fastest and easiest way to get involved. With a little bit more sophistication, maybe some programming, there are viewers, there are augmented reality viewers out there. This is like what uh, furniture manufacturers are starting to do where you can augment furniture around, you know, your space at scale, um, where you're maybe introducing your data, which would be the furniture, and then the viewer is, you know, whatever the viewer is. Or for a doctor, you know, if you have like volumetric data, like say DICOM data, which would be, you know, an output from a CT scan or an MRI machine, and it slices pictures that have to be converted into some sort of volume rendering, or, uh, you know, there are viewers to do such things like that. And we're going to cover some of that. And then, of course, something our lab has been helping with for the last 20 years with VR and AR, which is building your own custom application and using your own data, you know, with that. So that's going to take the longest amount of time, most investment from your end, but you're going to have full control over what the end result is. 
So that was type one, two, and three, and it kind of just increases in complexity. And I'll reference that as we go through this. Okay, so this is a type one case. So this is the easiest case, and this is something that uh, the SICE department here showed me a few months back. Um, it's made by the World Wildlife Fund, and this is an AR kit application, so it exists on an iPhone. It's, it's free, I believe. Um, and this is a teaching application where you actually would plot a landscape on a table. Um, I got a video here. I'll go ahead and play that. I'm going to ask Robert Ping, can you see this video, by the way? You can see it? Okay. I can see it. Great. Excellent. If you can hear it or not, it's not that important. I really just want, want you all to kind of see what's going on here. So using an iPhone. Right, so a simulated experience in the real world. The benefit of why augmented reality with this probably comes into play when you're talking about teaching because you can display that. Multiple people can look at the, the display and you can kind of, it's not a shared experience. Like I can't look at the same thing as someone else with another iPad or iPhone, but I can at least kind of crowd around one screen with someone and say, oh, you see that, you see that, try this, try that. So it's somewhat of a, a teaching tool. Uh, it's just one example, there are many. If you just search augmented reality on Android and iOS store, if you don't know that already, there are lots of apps out there that uh, use a variety of backends to, uh, to do some somewhat sophisticated AR and somewhat not so sophisticated. There's a lot of people tinkering and publishing on that. Okay, so this is an example of a type two. So this is like a viewer. Uh, Trimble is a commercial operation that used to, they basically sold their product sketch up to Google at one time and then Trimble bought it back from Google or maybe the contract ended. I don't know, but it's Trimble is basically into BIM uh, building information. Uh, man, is that what business stands for? Management. And uh, BIM data is something that's generated usually by some sort of, you know, architectural group and they're going to be informing the contractors on how to actually construct a building or, or maybe where maintenance can access certain areas. And, Trimble uh, Connect is an extension of their product series that allows you to do this on a job site with a Microsoft HoloLens and it is a shared experience. You can have multiple HoloLenses all looking at the same design. I do have a video on this one too. This is actually one of their customers using it. So that was helpful for me to realize this wasn't like vaporware. It's actually somewhat useful. Now we don't have this available at IU, but I did want to make people aware that it does exist. You could of course build other things in SketchUp than BIM data and probably augment them on a site, but you can then again use things other than Trimble SketchUp to do that. But it is interesting to see this sort of outlet, you know, this market may being engaged. Okay. Moving on from there, this is uh, one I actually found recently. Uh, some of you involved with uh, geography, geology um, might find this interesting. It's a data platform and it's an open source project called, uh, it's really just called HoloLens Terrain Viewer. And Esri, the, the maker of ArcGIS, uh, published this in 2014 and they evolved it as they got access to a HoloLens and, and then they stopped suddenly in like 2016, but it's open source on GitHub, so you can download this and use it. I was surprised that the code is old, so I'm gonna to contribute to the project and update it for the latest copy of Unity and uh, the HoloLens SDK. But I was able to get at least their uh, networking feature working. So I'm gonna do a live demo for you here. I'm turning on the HoloLens right now for those watching online, I'm gonna str stream my screen actually. So let's escape out of this. Go to the device portal. I think this will be it, Bill. You can probably see it just through the screen share. Is that true? Can you see what I'm seeing? No. 
No? Okay. I think it has your other screen. It has a YouTube as you gather. Oh, yeah. Now, if I full screen it, can you see it? Yep. Okay. So ArcGIS has, is a resource for folks working with terrain data. And what's nice is they have a huge data collection that you can pull from. So in the HoloLens here, I can see my cursor, but I put the app up here on the wall. So now I've got this sort of platform. And when I, when I finish out the fixing up their code, I'll be able to actually attach that to the table. But for right now, I can just make a, a verbal call. So the interface is verbal. So I can say, show Hoover Dam. And that's loading in uh, from the web. So there's a little misalignment there. Let me just step back. Uh, show Los Angeles. All right, so the idea here is that you can have multiple HoloLenses all looking at the same, but you can pull down data from the web and it's just gonna go ahead and build it out for you. Show Machu Picchu. Maybe it didn't hear me. Show Machu Picchu. There it goes. Okay. So that just acts as a data platform. You can extend it from there. If I open up uh, their GitHub repo, which I'll share a different screen. Actually, no, I can just leave this. Uh, maybe I didn't put it. This I just wanted to make clear on how kind of malleable this project is. They have this configuration where um, prior to building the app, you can put in your voice commands and it, it's, it's simply a, uh, a C sharp file here. So you can see they've got uh, Hoover Dam as the explicit thing you say show Hoover Dam and then you use the uh, coordinates just from GPS coordinates. And they actually recommend using Wikipedia's as a resource for certain like major landmarks. You can use, you can use Google Earth as well. Okay, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Okay. So that's an interesting open source project. There's a lot of them. Uh, Microsoft has the MR toolkit, mixed reality toolkit. So this is a collection that, that anybody can contribute to. And then Microsoft is sort of the arbiter of what actually goes out publicly, but it's been branched like a ton of times. It's really popular of a repo on GitHub. And they have a medical example where you can actually take DICOM data and actually convert it to work in the HoloLens. What's great about this package is you can also use it on their Windows Mixed Reality headsets, which are VR headsets. And, you know, you can compile for the HoloLens or those headsets like very quickly. Like I want to say less than 10 seconds of adjustment in terms of the configuration. So again, another video, I'm going to pop back out, drag this over. Man. There we go. You see that okay, Bill? Yeah. So really they're just moving around a uh, sort of a viewing volume of this DICOM data. There are of course lots of ways to view DICOM data and there are some more advanced virtual reality systems that in my opinion actually render, render a little bit better. But if you're just interested in the HoloLens, um, this is sort of an entry point or Windows Mixed Reality Okay, get the idea there. Let's go back to screen two, get rid of this. So at IU, um, I have some examples to show you today. Uh, this one is a project that I worked on with mechanical engineering technology. So they're actually technically a Purdue school, but the problem to solve was that students in class were having a hard time. These are, I think, freshman, sophomore, as far as their undergraduate 
progression goes. Uh, having a hard time conceptualizing the three shape of objects that they were milling, machining, like machining, laving, whatever the part was for. But in the end, they were assembling a miniature steam engine. They would hook up to an air compressor that would simulate the steam and they would operate if the tolerances were proper and it was assembled properly. So to help the students actually generalize the 3D shape of these objects, uh, we created an augmented reality uh, application that they could install on Android devices. And the purpose was essentially just to look at the blueprints and just have the parts augmented off the surface. And I did a video of this one today as well. So I'll bring that up. Okay, so the student actually built this completely herself. I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one consulting with her. So it's again a type, you know, the third type, a completely custom app, custom data, as far as uh, an AR application goes. So again, I asked the professor, you know, why didn't you just use like regular parts on the blueprints to, to demonstrate the 3D shape? And he said, ah, augmented reality is just kind of cool. So again, the cool factor of augmented reality really does play a role. Uh, Chauncey, question, please. Does Android, iOS, before you both? That's right, yeah. Is one easier than the other? So the question was, does Vuforia, which is the, the plugin that is involved in this application, uh, does it work on uh, Android, iOS, um, HoloLens? And yes, it's a cross-platform uh, plugin, and it only really works on mobile devices. You can think of the HoloLens as a mobile device. Uh, Magic Leap is another new headset. We don't have those at IU yet, as far as I know. Um, our lab's looking at uh, maybe getting one. And the interesting thing is, like, before I just heard the other day, they're adding support for Magic Leap now that their SDK is out. So that's just a uh, sort of a rapid cross-platform plugin. And really it comes down to just image recognition. And you, again, are, are limited to mobile devices. So I couldn't run Vuforia on say, you know, a desktop. And then here's another example. That's, yeah, it is easy to implement on all of those platforms as easy as it is to develop for so it's a little bit more difficult to compile an ios application than it is for an android device but you know it's not much more for those it's going to be the same amount of time to develop is that what your question was yeah, yeah. okay so this one uh what's interesting about this project and i'll come back to this concept is we used uh digitization so this is a service that jeff rogers talked about uh i guess a couple weeks ago two weeks ago and we actually were building a training tool for folks learning how to work with uh, medical biomedical devices. So you can imagine a defibrillator kit having an augmented reality training scenario. And the students that worked on this, again, they were a team I worked on with one-on-one. -on -one. And oops, the purpose of this was to build as simple of a scenario that they could maybe pitch this to companies local in Indianapolis and, and build out the same scenario for like maybe a MRI machine or something like that. So at the time, Vuforia uh, it was really the dominant, most reliable workflow, and it was sort of the easiest to teach. So that was the choice to, to use an image target. So we're looking at the real devices there on the left side of that screen, and then on the right is an augmented version of those that were 3D scanned or digitized. And very large buttons titled one, two are the steps. And there's, there's actually audio feedback that uh, kind of kicks in. So when you click the buttons, It'll annotate and then give you some sort of narrator feedback on what to look for. Is this still using all those barcodes for the register? Yeah, so that, that sheet he rolled out is just what well, you just anchor everything to that. As we'll talk about later, tracking systems with augmented reality are uh, really a Wild West show right now.
what was neat about this was these students, uh, some of them was their first year ever in college and <laughs> right away within like the first three weeks of they're using a, you know, $25,000 Creoform Go scan and they're learning how to 3D scan objects. And then I'm teaching them how to program in C sharp. So like rapidly they were, they became pretty good implementers uh, of this concept. Oh yeah. And then this is before the HoloLens was available. So they had, they bought this off the shelf see-through hardware. In my opinion, I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. Um, I don't even remember the brand and they tried to get that working. It kind of worked, but lining up things with optical see-through headsets is, is tricky, but luckily there's devices like the HoloLens, which is they've pretty much solved a lot of those problems for you. You don't have to think about it. Uh, so kind of going more advanced, this is uh, what's cool about this. The last couple I've been showing you are that type three where you're uh, building your own application with your own data set. Uh, this one, we started like that. So we built our own application to do pre-visualization of prosthetics. So the story goes that uh, Dr. Balaci here worked with a team of informatics folks and in our laboratory to help them build a workflow for 3D printing out uh, prosthetics. So unbelievably, if you're going to get a prosthetic for your leg, you'll go to a different type of doctor versus if you have a prosthetic for your face, you'll have to go to a dentist, a prosthodontist. And uh, Travis asked me one time, hey, how, how can I maybe pre-visualize these sculpted um, these sculpted prosthetics. And I probably didn't make that clear that when they 3D scan a patient's face, that patient may have had cancer at one time and had a portion of their face removed uh, just to save their life. So this poor guy, uh, Shirley Anderson here, he's actually missing his entire lower jaw and he's wearing an application in this photo. Uh, so Travis would like, since you're working with digital files, uh, an iteration loop is really what he was asking for. How can I, as a doctor, work, meet with my patient, build an application, and if they have complaints about it, respond to that feedback, but then also before responding to that feedback, just augment on their face what it might look like if we make changes. So that's called pre-visualization. It's utilized in a lot of different areas. That would be what we were looking at with the Trimble Connect. That's pre-visualization of a construct, construction kind of terrestrial environment. So this student's very uh, ambitious, Mark Sporleter, he reached out to me and he said, hey, I could, I could scan my head and build sort of a one size fits all for different size heads, um, 3D printed headgear, and we could build a, uh, an application where we extend maybe the HTC Vive, which is a VR headsets tracking system to work with the HoloLens. And I, at the same time, had just so happened to stumble upon a GitHub open source project from the University of Rochester that allowed you to make the Vive tracking system kind of a sub tracking system to the HoloLens and cal calibrate them together. So we worked together to just kind of build a quick mock-up here. And that's what you're seeing in this photo is Mark actually with the headgear, the tracked object there and a pre-visualized sculpted nose for Mark. Um, I actually have two quick videos for this one. So this is the scenario, right? So the doctor, you can, as you might imagine, can wear the headgear while the patient kind of just sits there. Um, but, oh yeah. Come on, mouse. Yeah, I don't know why my cursor doesn't want to show up. All right. And then this is a, Early on in the development of this project, this was a successful test. We were able to extend the HoloLens to work with this open source code. So you can see there's latency built in. You know, this would be something later to fix. There's a lot of extra features we could have gone with. Um, but, you know, as we went along with this project, Apple announced face scanning, uh, like real time face scanning in their AR kit project. You see what happened? We started extending this, it's like kind of just boiling the ocean, working very hard to build a prototype throwing hardware at the problem. And then Apple says, oh no, we've got this, you know, free solution through our, you know, our free plugin so that you'll use iPhones and it does face tracking. So Travis is on that now working with Apple developers at IEPY to uh, use, do pre-visualization with facial tracking. So then what's nice is you, you're able to actually render the, uh, I don't have any examples of that yet, but to actually render the facial prosthetic. And then as you move your face, it will transform with your face's morphology. So again, bring your own device. That's the model we're following. Um, like I said, there is not really a flagship uh, augmented reality solution that the AVL has really deployed over the years. Um, of course, we're going to probably keep up with some, some of the high quality sought after platforms that are somewhat expensive. 
uh, a few thousand dollars for these headsets. This one's like three to five, depending on the software back end you buy, the Microsoft HoloLens. And these are, uh, I think, about $700 cheaper than that. So this is the Magic Leap 1. These are, would be emerging head-mounted displays. And then, of course, as I've been kind of already talking through, there are lots of mobile devices, tablets, and smartphones that can do augmented reality. You can still do augmented reality on desktops, by the way. This was originally the form that AR Toolkit used through just C++ as a webcam and a desktop. People built kiosks. I was involved in a few projects where we used kiosks through just a desktop. Uh, and as you can imagine, you know, this type of headset, as it becomes more commoditized and just gets better and better, um, if we start seeing this in consumers' hands, this will just kind of merge into the same kind of realm as, as these devices, right? They won't be emerging exciting platforms so, or uh, advanced platforms. They'll be, it, they'll be more of a, just a regular mobile device. So our role in the AVL really comes down to just really keeping an eye on uh, useful workflows, staying away from commercial products. If we can go open source, let's go open source. Um, I'm really excited about new web technologies using, say, JavaScript backends, or you can, you can distribute widely over the internet just as web applications for augmented reality. So, In terms of folks coming to me asking, how do I make my own augmented reality? Uh, this is a tool, a couple tools here, HP Reveal, which used to be called Erasma, and Wikitude. And these are what I would consider viewers. Um, you have some control because there, there is some sort of publishing step you have to take when you're building out content. You can think of HP Reveal as a platform that allows you to essentially put any 3D, 2D text, you know, any kind of media data where you want it in terms of an image target, okay? And they have a publishing uh, function within their own application so that they have their own ecosystem. So that sounds a little weird, but what that means is if you download an HP Reveal, um, you can search through HP Reveal and find thousands of publicly accessible projects that people are building. And, you know, a lot of this is just quick mock-ups, you know, say like I wanted to augment this IQ wall. Um, I might actually just have HP Reveal set up with a selection of different IQ wall designs and just kind of put a target on the wall and click one and render the IQ wall and then chat with folks as, as you're in the room. It's a quick way to do it. Um, same thing goes for Wikitude, but the, the other problem that Wikitude solves is the other types of tracking. So it does, it does image tracking as well, and it's a little bit more involved in terms of developing, but you don't have to program using Wikitude Studio, but it will do location-based augmented reality. So you can do GPS locations, beacons, if you've ever heard of those, those are usually devices that uh, emit some sort of RF that talks to your mobile device. You can, you can actually have AR pop up when the presence of a Wi-Fi SSID is around. Um, so these two are what I consider onboarding tools, folks to get started building augmented reality that don't wanna learn programming. Now in terms of like I said, like building your own app, type three development. The base package is almost always Unity these days. And from Unity, there's a variety of plugins. Um, not from Unity, but from other vendors, um, other open source projects. All of these are commercial except for AR Toolkit. Uh, Viewforia is a dominant one. Like I said, it's, it's set up to work on mobile devices and it's for image tracking. And AR Toolkit works with image tracking, but it'll also work on a desktop. So you can actually publish out to Mac, PC, Linux as a standalone application. It's just something you can't do with that or this, basically any of these. Uh, the back end of this now is C Sharp in Unity, as you can imagine, if you're familiar with Unity. Microsoft HoloLens has a plugin that used to be outside of Unity and is now built into the, the package itself. What's nice about that is you can hybridize other types of packages. You can actually hybridize this with that and do and gain image tracking within the Microsoft HoloLens, which we'll talk about later. AR Core is an Android deployment for competing with AR Kit. Literally, they reacted to AR Kit by producing AR Core. <laughs> so, from what I've read, uh, the Google engineers were already dabbling and they're like, oh, well, let's just hurry up and get ours up to the same spec and we'll just kind of tit for tat meet Apple, just the way they do with every, every other pro mobile product. So Apple, if I didn't make it clear, makes AR kit, and that's what I'm showing here. Um, so iOS versus Android. And these, these two modern packages that are only recently deployed, they do a type of tracking called area learning tracking. They use a webcam or maybe a laser scanner built into the device. 
and they just keep an eye, an eye on the room, the environment that you're in within a certain range and you can kind of find flat surfaces. So that earlier demonstration I showed you with the World Wildlife Fund where it had the terrain on the table, that was an AR kit example. It could, could have well been developed in AR core, but as you deploy it, you can actually click on the table and that locks your content at that spot. And then you can walk around within a reasonable range, like a few meters in every, every direction, as long as you kind of continue to come back to that spot and your, your content will stay locked in that position. You know, that, that does ring a bell. Someone says something about it. Oh, okay. Is that recent then? Yeah, so the question was, is AR Toolkit still an open source project or is they, are they bought out in commercial? Uh, they did go through a big branding thing and if, you, if, if you're saying Daiquiri bought them, I believe you. Yeah, I think Daiquiri bought them and then opened them and then put it back out of them. Oh, they did, okay. So if Daiquiri bought them, put them back out of open source, that's good, but still you still have now the commercial connection. So you, to be suspicious of such things because as, as the product gets better, the tool set could just disappear one day. That happened with... Uh, as folks that go back maybe a few years developing augmented reality, they might have used one called, um, people used to call it Matayo. That was a way to pronounce it, but it was actually Meta.io was, yeah, Apple bought it. And it, it literally disappeared the next day and they had a web page up on their developer forum saying no more support will be offered and uh, your terms of agreement are terminated. You know, basically they just stopped letting you use the plugin. It's a horrible thing, but I mean, that's an illustration of what you have to be worried about. People made companies. What's that? <laughs> That's awful. Yeah, this, yeah, we're nipping at the heels of Silicon Valley and things need to be monetized, I understand, but you know, academic research needs to be respected and needs to continue to live on. So choosing the right tools in the beginning is always a good idea. All right, so I'm an analyst for the laboratory and when I work with somebody that wants to work with augmented reality that may not be familiar with it, I've got to bring reality into the conversation in terms of limitations of systems. Um, I've probably confused you if you're not aware of these plugins on what they can do as far as mobile devices versus what type of tracking and what does that mean? So this is a chart that I broke down and it's pretty busy. But at the top here we have augmented reality tracking systems and then I'm not sure why the IQ all grayed out a couple of these, but they shouldn't be, they're all equal, but you have these different zones of types of tracking. So you can all imagine probably marker tracking. This is what we're used to, right? If you're familiar with augmented reality, these are like 2D, like QR codes can track. And as long as the device camera can see that, you can track off of that images. 3D objects can be markers to be tracked. So these are anchor points, you know, starting points for your content to stay and let you spatially examine or interact with it. Um, and then beyond that, there's body tracking. You know, that's not as common, but you can augment body parts. In fact, something I don't highlight in this talk today, projection mapping is a type of augmented reality. You're still putting data into the real world in some sort of visual fashion. And folks are doing that with projection mapping where you can track a person's body with say an Xbox Connect and project onto their body. They've done this with dancers and actually it's happened here at IU now a little bit. Um, I can't recall exactly the name of the project, so I'll have to look that up for next time. And then location-based, there are a variety of tools to do this. You can extend most of these packages to do like location-based if you're based in Unity because it's a cross-platform compiler and most mobile devices have GPSs in, and Unity has base level support for location-based detection for events. So that's kind of interesting. And then area learning is this new sort of magic area. So in just the last four years, we've seen an explosion in tools, hardware and software tools that can do area learning. They all have different ways of doing it. I made a GIF for you all to kind of ex express what I mean by area learning if you're not already aware. You have some sort of display device that can detect the real world and actually assign uh, geometry to it. So what you're seeing here is a view through the HoloLens. Oh, I should have set that to repeat. Let me reset the slide. And what you're seeing here are polygons of the IT414 laboratory in the AVL in Indianapolis. And as I look around, it's just annotating the room with these polygons. But what's nice is that's a spatial map. That's a 3D geometry collection that I can extract from the HoloLens and utilize so that I could augment in that space. Or just detect to have occlusion. You know, that's another thing is if I have a piece of furniture here and a hologram behind it, some sort of augmentation, I want that furniture to occlude it, to block it when I have it in between my line of sight and the object. 
All right, so some advanced techniques I'd like to discuss today um, include a, a few tutorials, right? So these are some resources for you. Uh, and also just some pointers. So on the, the left there, you're looking at uh, tra tracking system fusion. So you're seeing a view through the HoloLens. And I'll try to explain as we're going along. And this is a long tutorial, it's 32 minutes long. And I'll explain what's going on here. The HoloLens does area learning uh, out of the box. It, it already can accomplish this in an automated fashion. So there's an, a map happening in this Unity scene. So you're looking at the Unity editor here. And I'm aligning a, an image, okay, to the top right of my door frame in my office. And the purpose of this is that if you're going to augment a physical space, let's say this room, and you want maybe a tour group to come through with a pair of like a headset, in, or maybe even your work, your research study groups coming in, you're going to curate locations of your visualizations around the room so you can collectively walk together and see stuff at the same spot in the space. You know, it's hard right away to have a canned example for a room with the HoloLens, which you would think would be simple, right? If I'm going to augment a museum, why can't I just deploy a whole bunch of HoloLenses and let people pick them up at the door and walk around my museum? Well, the HoloLens starts tracking and understanding the room at runtime, so therefore it has no way to calibrate to the real world space unless you pre-cache it. You can use image targets everywhere, right? That's not a really sustainable way to do it though. Um, so what you're looking at here is I've pre-mapped the room, let's say my museum or my laboratory, and I'm aligning an image target for initial calibration only. So I'm applying a simple shader to the environment so that we just can see the polygons. And at, at runtime, I take the HoloLens and look at this target on the wall and it does an alignment behind the scenes. It's actually moving the environment and kind of ratcheting it together so that they line up. So this is a view through the HoloLens. And then as I look at that, that, those green lines appear and I'm able to see that, you know, things are generally lining up. And this is a, an iteration you have to go through and just make sure you don't move your marker. And uh, you can follow this tutorial and then sort of anchor uh, data into your space specifically. I'm going to fast forward in this video to the final result. And ask why you're doing that. You have to have specific versions of, soft, of compilers and things like that to uh, no, no. Uh, when you first got it going, you had to have like this version. Right. That, that's actually pretty cleaned up now. So the HoloLens, I recommend always having the latest. Um, the reason for that is if you have code that exists in an older copy of Unity and you try to compile into an older SDK or a newer SDK, you're going to get stopped by this. And it's because this goes through Windows updates and it keeps itself up to the latest SDK. Unless you force that to stop, you're always going to have to continue to keep on that. So that's not... That's not great, but that is what we have to live with. Uh, I'm gonna fast forward here. The, the end result was just, I wanna put a cube on my desk in my office. So I initially calibrate, I see the green lines. The HoloLens uses the image tracking initially, and now it's switching to spatial mapping. So as I look around the room, it didn't see my cube on the desk, there's a problem. So I go back and look at the target. Okay, now things have caught up. And as I look back at my desk, there's the cube, okay? And then now you can don't even have to look at that image target anymore because the area learning system takes over or spatial mapping. There's a lot of names for it, but essentially what it, the HoloLens does, SLAM, S-L-A-M stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. That's the, that's the algorithm, that's the name of it. And what these devices are doing is using some strategy to map and figure out where the camera is in that map at the same time, as fast as I can. Okay. So like I said, that's like a 30 minute tutorial. If you'd like that, uh, just email Viz help, which I'll have that email up at the end and I can point you to any uh, resources that make sense for you. All right. Now I mentioned that's a, that's a technique called uh, tracking system fusion. So we, we did a marker tracker and a spatial uh, or aerial learning tracker and put them together and we get this nice scenario where we can recreate the same experience every time by just looking at that image. Now, on the right here, we're doing uh, a tracking subsystem. So we're still doing a fusion between two different tracking systems. But what's happening here is, is Patrick here is actually building out cubes in a VR headset. 
using a VR systems tracking system, which is a really accurate, but still not portable kind of fixed tracking system. And the HoloLens is a somewhat portable tracking system. You can kind of fire it up anywhere and it works, but how does the HoloLens peer into that tracking system and have them co-locate co properly? To, so that the data actually is accurate. Actually, I switched this video. It's it's of Bill now. So um, since he's doing these talks here. There we go. I'll rewind it. So this is an open source project from the University of Rochester. The initial calibration isn't shown, but it's quite simple. You turn the headset on and turn the VR session on. It renders a, a handset in the space and you click the handset by putting your hand in that space. And it, it basically aligns the HoloLens with the, the Vive tracking space. And all you can do with this is just build cubes with their base level uh, project. You're just setting two vectors and then it builds a, a cube around you or a cuboid six sided. And, uh, you can of course extend this, and that's what we did with uh, the. That's what I was doing. <laughs> what were you doing? Oh, nice. Yeah. You did. <laughs> so then there you go. <laughs> I deleted his stuff. Yeah. No, I, I just exited the application. Uh, so Bill could actually see me in that app. I was represented by a green cube floating around beyond his track space. So that's kind of neat. So you actually extend the VR track space too. It's not as useful, but uh, I don't know, that's arguable. I guess it depends on what you're doing. Oh, come on, cursor. Am I using the wrong mouse? I'm using the wrong mouse. That's what's going on. All right. So uh, I want to mention a few things here, though, before I move on. So tracking system fusion is like an area of, like, I don't know, it's a proud area for a lot of developers because once you get it working where you can kind of hybridize a certain type of tracking with another and it's not easy, you've become this like, <laughs> like center of how did you do that? You know, a lot of people want to know how to combine say facial tracking with uh, spatial learning. I, I don't know, it just depends on what you're doing or like the military, they would want to visualize say telemetry data if they're standing on the ground looking up at say a UAV flying around, how the heck do you track miles up into the air on, in real time of where that's going. My friend Colin is here today. He and I graduated from School of Informatics and Computing in Indianapolis. He's a beekeeper. So like a project that he might want to do as a beekeeper, because he's somewhat professional at it. How do we track bees, you know, and how do we in real time see an augmentation of these bees moving around? You know, that can be sensed by a system, but maybe it could become a subsystem of augmented reality. So this might be an area of engineering that it would behoove you to kind of carve out a niche because if you need to track a certain type of activity and you build a system to track that, it would even be better if you could extend that to become a subsystem, sub tracker for an augmented reality system that's popular, say a headset or a tablet so that you can sort of extend it beyond its basic tracking. So I think augmented reality sub tracking systems will be interesting. There's a tour around campus that, uh, the Indiological, Indy, Indiana Geological Survey Group does, Gary Motes invited me to do it, Eric, you did it. Um, and where they're doing a limestone tour around campus uh, of, these buildings are built with limestone cover on the outside, and this is a very historic area of the world for limestone. So how the heck do you sit, stand on the ground and look up at a building with certain parts of limestone everywhere, details that you, a tour guide is emphatically trying to communicate to you what those are, how to think about them. And really they, what they want is just a digital annotation up there, right? To explain, maybe even have videos floating in everywhere, but how do you anchor augmented reality graphics to those spaces, right? So there may be an opportunity there for some sort of software innovation or hardware innovation to extend a commonly used VR or AR system to track, you know, within a, like an outdoor tour type environment. So this is a thing to think about, you know, this is an area that, you know, everyone that comes to me that asks to do some sort of fanciful type of augmented reality, even if it is scientific visualization, how do you, how do you track beyond just the limitations of the devices? So lastly here, another advanced technique is digitized occlusion. So when you're tracking an object, this is a type of object tracking that you can do is just track 3D objects. What if, what if you could actually, uh, when you spin it around, have the 3D geometry occluded. That may not be 
um, obvious what I'm talking about. Let me play this video. I'm using the correct mouse. There it is. All right, so this is a bloodletting bowl that was digitized. Um, and over here on the left side of the screen, you can see that the 3D representation is there. And then shortly here, I'm kind of showing off. It's a magic trick, right? So there's a uh, 3D representation that was pretty photorealistic, matched up with the real world one. But what's nice is if I advance this video through, you'll see that the technique I use is to turn off the shader color and just turn on the occlusion function of the shader. And then you get this ability to build um, annotation, but it, it, it properly responds. So as I rotate this bowl, you'll see that the text kind of goes in front of the bowl. Yeah, right there. So that's incorrect, right? But by digitizing the object, now we can use the occlusion capability of a shader and block the annotation. And then it doesn't seem odd to the user. It could be pretty, if pretty fairly accurate. I mean, most folks aren't even going to recognize that little gap there. So again, what matters where it matters. If it, one of the projects that keeps coming up that we, I, I'd love to find a home for is let's look at our HPC systems at IU. We have these amazing supercomputers. I love to some, somehow visualize on that surface or within it or around it, or even just on the data center, you know, some sort of relevant real-time data, you know, maybe core temperatures. I don't know how interesting that is, but maybe you do a visualization with core temperatures. Um, I just, for the National Park Service, I, I 3D printed geomorphology of the Mount Baldy game in 1950, they're using them airbrushed and did some stuff and they're using them on the site with the interpreters and you know, a lot of good reviews but this would be really awesome to yeah. combine uh, those two two techniques so digitization does this too like it's like all of a sudden you now pay attention to these things that were created maybe decades ago that were airbrushed and nice and, and like artifacts right so you digitize them but this is one application of visualization you can apply right so you could stand back with some air display and and use that object as the tracker or some sort of spatial map and then annotate, animate, interact. There's lots of options. So uh, the AR sandbox, now you're playing with object tracking, but display AR on the AR sand, and there's a whole other possibility there to be able to have. But I love the idea of info, the, the metadata combined. Yeah. There's a, there's a big initiative too with digitization uh, within our organization and, and cyber DH to sort of like standardize. And then also the universities are trying to do this as we do more 3D scanning of objects. It's like, maybe we could standardize the metadata, right? So then an, an AR viewer for that would be just, let's have it ready to go with any digitized data that comes in. We understand the standard and let's visualize it and then let you, you know, direct the annotation, I guess, uh, of how that may be displayed. I don't know how relevant some of the metadata is to be visualized, but you know, there's opportunity there to make a standardized viewer, right? For standardized di digitized things. So it's a nice little hookup between two different areas. I'm gonna show you another example. This is less of an advanced technique and more of just an idea. So if you have say technical items, I'm gonna share my, oh, let's see here. How are we doing this bill? I can't remember. <laughs> so I need to share contact from a camera and then switch cameras. So that's my laptop camera and there's me and then Bill's going to be the cameraman. So I've got a, an older Android tablet. This is like an older generation galaxy Samsung tablet and we've got an old video card, but you can imagine this is a new video card and I have maybe many, many more in a closet somewhere, or maybe I'm a mechanic and this is just some box of a part at a shop or I'm in a chemistry laboratory and I've got, you know, all of these little vials of, of uh, aqueous solutions. Like, what is exactly is that? And, and can we hook up to a database and actually like, you know, annotate what, what this technical information is instead of me going back to a computer console and looking things up. So what we're looking at here is, uh, I'm showing the camera so folks can see, is I'm holding the video card up and this application is just an example of what you can do. So I can touch the screen and it will annotate what we were just talking about, metadata associated. 
And you could do this with lots of parts, hook it up to a database and have it live on. So Gary Motes is involved with the uh, IT infrastructure for paleontology, the Indiana Indiana Geological Survey. Uh, and it's something he's trying to do where you may eventually be able to look at a fossil and then actually have on that surface of that fossil some specific metadata that just pops right up. And they have like millions of fossils. Some of them are large, small, microscopic. So going along with that, I have some examples from the paleontology group. So these are just image targets. So pictures of these extinct animals. Please don't ask me what they are. <laughs> uh, so if I hold this up, this is a digitized uh, jaw or mandible. And my battery's running low. Bill, if you can touch that screen there, you can show the, or just spin it, just drag. Yeah. So there was a feature there to actually drag across the screen. Okay. Let me close down my battery notification. All right. Um, and there's a couple more here. Should last just enough longer. So this is actually a Mastodon 2. Thank you. And what's great about this is this was a starter. So this was a prototyping exercise that I went with, went through with Gary and his, his uh, graduate students. And we produced that application and we didn't really go much further than that. We just have a standalone of Euphoria. It's available, you can do that. And I'm not gonna stop you or anything like that. Uh, I say go for it and I'll do my best to support that user. I'm probably not gonna be as uh, capable of supporting more advanced requests. But um, what's really neat about that is Unreal tends to look a lot better than Unity right out of the box, right? The shaders just, they just seem more vivid and more professional looking. So then is uh, Unity, you said, uh, I in particular, is that something you all do particularly, or is that the uh, academic community as a whole has embraced No one said that that's the standard, I'll be clear. But if you go to a conference now, say IEEE VR, and there's some AR applications and VR applications. I mean, run a survey for yourself. You'll find that it's just so dominantly popular. It's kind of, okay. yeah. 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 So, uh, I do sense a shift. Hey, Chauncey, this is Robert. If you can repeat the questions that people are asking in the room, that would be great. Yeah. So, repeat this other thing. Uh, it's important to keep alive so that there is no unity. Yeah, because we might find that, you know, they sell off to Microsoft, you know, question. My biggest struggle is a new adopter, and it's coming from Earth Scientist first and program to second, is the is the divide between uh, uh, pushing to iOS, pushing to the Android store, making that that jump between Unity to getting it to the yeah. end user. Because right now, I just hand people my tablet and they don't know I'm actually just running it straight from Unity. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's like, you know, now I got to dedicate X months of time to learn how to to deploy an iOS we, we really need not to be uh, in the Okay, so the question uh, Okay, we need not to be in the in the AR community of developers. We need not to be building local apps at all. Like there's no reason other than performance to grab from the mobile device and mobile devices is arguable if they have enough performance anyway to, you know, like a desktop for VR makes sense, right? Cause you can do a local app with a desktop and you can put tons of horsepower in a desktop. You're not going to do that with AR. So we need not to be building local apps. We need to be shifting to web distribution, building web apps. The technology is there. Heck, there's a, the biggest building downtown Indianapolis is based on React JS, like Salesforce tower is filled with engineers that are using React on a daily basis. And React has lots and lots of avenues for open source AR. And you know that's something I'm planning on mapping out 
for support here. And then we also have a, a developer within our lab who's working with Angular, which is sort of a, a Google spinoff, right? And that also works with a, a library called 3JS, which is an extension of web, uh, I guess, OpenGL from kind of the older 3D graphics days, but it's the same concepts. And now it's in the JavaScript world. So if you're proficient with JavaScript, stay with it and keep an eye out there for something that makes sense for you. But because I think that if you you use a web app, it's going to live on and on. X3D is a great example because it is a, it's essentially a web technology. You can build and deploy it almost like an HTML page. It's XML yes. syntax. Something that came out of you guys, X3D. Eric is, you guys, I think that's why. Eric is on, on their uh, advisory board, right? No. No? But, but it, is, it is an ISO standard. Okay? So it's not right, that's it. That's right. Level of, uh, hardening and survivability uh, that comes with something like that. And we really, uh, yeah, it's tough as from the practitioner side. It's like the landscape is changing so quickly, and that to actually do anything of value, you you have to, you know, use what's uh, available and doing, and then because business and commerce is pushing development more than or not only more, but parallel with academia, it's really tough to like, okay, do I wait two years for academia to come up with an open source standard version, or do I leverage before at Unity, because right. I can actually get something out the door in six months, I think we're gonna use this. Well, I mean, we're not, 20, in 2018, we're not talking about a spatialized internet yet, right? And I think it, it may be not called spatial internet or spatialized internet, but the point is that spatial technologies like VR and AR are getting rapid technology backends now for like the production of web application or websites. And uh, it's not going to be long before that's a major conversation point. It's not going to be me evangelizing. It's just going to happen because a company that likes to manage a content service that has a backend that they manage or even a researcher that wants to deploy their research. It's like, you don't want to have to go through this red tape of publishing a local app and then having to be at the mercy of Apple or Google to have it published out there and then maintain the application. And you're at the mercy of, of the updates that come into these operating systems. So with a web application, you can at least deploy it. The DOM, the, you know, the actual renderer in a browser changes, but it's, it's sort of standardized more towards the open source community um, because there's so many web apps out there. They don't want to advance it too far because it'll break people's, you know, business, right. Or, or what they do. And I, I just think it's a, a better way to go about it, you know? So then, you know, there are some hard problems to solve. We don't really have a standard solution to stream bytes of 3d data to a spot efficiently. Like we do with video. I mean, YouTube can stream down a 16 K video right here or to my phone and it works. I can't really do that with a 2 million poly count data set that I generated on the supercomputer. You know, it doesn't exist yet. So, you know, compression, decompression algorithms, we have to go back to the old days of computer science, uh, compression streaming problems and get it down to that two gigabytes per second standard that the internet lives by. So, or not two gigabytes per second. Uh, I forget the, I'm not that adverse in network uh, standards, but you know what I mean? It's yeah. an internet standard for how much bandwidth you're allowed to use. So, yeah, question. Uh, there's two forms of it. I'll be clear. Uh, what was that? So the question was, uh, Vuforia, the plugin uses object tracking. What's my opinion on it? Is that, that's right. Yeah, and this was the one example with the, the uh, digitized object. Was that object tracking as well? It was, and it was what we call primitive object tracking. So you, uh, Vuforia had an initial type of object tracking early on where they generalized the shape of an object to a sphere. It's really bizarre, but they would have like this ovalized sphere that would do its best to understand an object. So they had a scanner application, local app you download on your iOS or Android device, put a marker that you print out from a, just a eight and a half by 11, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, put your object on that. So it already had a limitation to the size of the object is that's how big your scan, scan space is. And then just walk around that object and it didn't actually digitize it per se to the actual shape of the object. What it did was encode the image of the perspectives into some sort of spherical observation. So it's like a database file. In the end, you don't actually get a 3D object out. You just get this like collection of perspectives out. 
that are in a database. And that's how the object tracked. That was their initial wave. And that actually works quite well, but again, it's limited. Now they have their new object tracking, which is immaculate. I mean, it's like you could 3D print out an object and then just take the same 3D print file, the STL, and like use that as your source and it'll track it. The problem is they put it behind a paywall. So before it actually charges for that feature, you can't just take it and use it. Okay. Yeah. So good luck. It's unfortunate. Uh, I don't actually have a functional object tracker in the lab of that more sophisticated thing, just because I don't think it's worth it to pursue these things behind paywalls unless it's really important for some IU researcher to have. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, speaking of paywalls, I guess, uh, you all have some iOS apps you can build on Unity and stuff like this. What do you do? I know some people have done that, but it's a very good question. So we, you have to have a provisioning profile, um, and IU has a service that's not through our lab in UITS to uh, to do just that. You know, to for folks to deploy one app to one device, and you provision the device. There's some sort of handshake between the, the operating system and your your Xcode project, which is now called something else. I forget. I'm not an iOS developer, but. Um, there's a gentleman in our laboratory I would introduce you to who might even introduce you to somebody else, but we do have a way to do it and it, it's free for as far as you, you can tell. Yeah. So is that your, What's that? Is it crane? You're a crane. Okay. Well, so uh, there, there is a way, there's a mechanism through Apple to, to, to I think it's like a hundred dollars. It's not that expensive and you get a provisioning profile and then you basically manage that and the devices that you have access to. So then you can have a range of iOS devices, build your app and check it on all those. That's the whole point. So that's sort of a commercial, uh, uh, I don't know, catering that Apple does, you know. Okay. And do they have a way to upload to an iOS device without having a MacBook? I know that used to do that. No, you still have to use iOS or, yes. yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, that's all, that's all that stuff. Like, every time. Oh yeah. Oh, well, even when you get in, even when you get in the world of a web app development, it, it sounds glorious when I talk about it, but it is so painful to go from say Angular to an AR app just because the the documentation sparse and it's changing every day and it's not really ready for prime time. That's why I don't have many slides about it because. I appreciate some of the entry level examples you showed earlier. And I, like, you know, the main, Wicked 2. Uh, HP Reveal. HP yeah. But those, those could solve one or two of my simple problems. Because I have some ideas about just a multi-user environment. Yeah. You know, I want people to, if I put you on object, be able to see it all easily without having to deploy to iOS. And these could solve some of those small problems. I was going to do a demo. I was going to do a demo of that. It's, you had said HP. I mean, ever since my first HP printer in 1996. <laughs> that was way they oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So I, I never well, this wasn't, that out myself without you. It, it was not developed by HP. It was Erasmus. And it was a really, <laughs> yeah, it's a very successful thing. Um, Tassi actually showed me it a long time ago. Uh, what's yeah, yeah. So HP owns Erasmus. This is the nature of AR right now. You can still use it. It's still got all the functions, and I don't, I don't see any paywalls yet, but yet. But I was able to like, I was sitting on my couch, and I just took a picture of like this slide, and I was able to take a three D model that I happen to have like an OBJ on my phone, and then upload it. And then it did augment right off the top of the slide. So as long as it took the upload was basically the length it took, you know, okay. it wasn't very long to just, I like that. You know, if you could prototype, that's a conversation point that lets folks around you react to it. That's really important. It's actually really easy to do it as well. We augmented a whole deck of cards. Uh, so with actual, so it was a, I had all the British rulers and stuff. So they took like actual portraits of the rulers. And then we actually found it was the very same outfit. She was in, uh, bars, so like, yeah, oh, cool! Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The, the 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 great thing about it is also solves the software maintenance problem. So once you deploy it publicly within their ecosystem, you just let it let it be because it'll work because this HP maintains it. Um, well, if you trust HP, but it, I could look up stuff from uh, a few years ago. They had a 
they had a, a DeLorean, someone had animated and made it look really cartoonish. And it was like published in the Erasma days and it was still working really great. It had a lot of features to it. It was interactive. So and, and HP Reveal now has a studio extension off of it. So you can add interactivity to it as well. But just from your cell phone alone, you can take a picture of your target, upload your model or text or whatever, assign the two and you save it. And then what it is, is it's sort of unlisted and then you can publish it out kind of like you would a, you know, publication on the internet, like YouTube or something. Mm -hmm. and then share that. Yep. So then you're, Hey, download HP reveal and look for this keyword and then they can find it and try it out. So yeah. Do we have Google glass? Uh, the ABL does not. There are other UITS groups that explored it. Yeah. It, it's actually found a home and a niche in warehouses and, and site management in terms of parts, you know, uh, have you ever used one? Uh, well, it was actually at Google X a couple years ago, and they showed us it. Okay. Um, so we have some kind of good applications for it. I mean, they're mainly just putting the PDF there yeah. in the view, but I got like a couple seconds with it. I just kind of want to try it again. Sure, yeah, yeah. Have you tried the hollow lens yet? Yeah, we have a hollow lens in the as well. Awesome. Uh, but interested in the Google Glass, they're apparently coming out with another one in the next, like, I don't know how long. See, I, I really. <laughs> For a long time, there were some rumors that the Magic Leap One was going to be called Google Glass <laughs> because it's got a, almost a billion dollars. Actually, I think it has a, over a billion dollars of Google money behind it. Yeah. Have you guys been talking with Magic Leap at all? I have. I, I, I just chatted a couple times with an engineer a year ago, and then recently I've just been talking with them about their, you know, unity stuff and then like i don't know as far as like i wanted to know about this right here so this is a magnetic tracker this is unique about the magic leap is it it's there's a company out there called paul hemis and they make vr trackers and just trackers in general for people to do research with but it basically just emits an electromagnetic field if you're familiar with like the old flock of birds tracking system it's similar to that and basically from your head you're getting emitted a you know a range of electromagnetic interference and then you have a handset that's tracked in full six degrees of freedom then with it. So that's unique compared to the hollow lens. And it does spatial mapping just like the hollow lens. The field of view is taller, but I, I don't know. It's for $2,700. I think it's not a bargain for a, a, an individual developer for IU. It might be okay. Unity, about the same stuff, but one of his comments was related to the communication in general, and he described uh, limitations of VR. It really comes down to the field of view, yeah. and really it's a nice sort of the aspect ratio between the hollow lens um, and some of the other things. And when you're trying to look at, say, a landscape, you're trying to look at yeah. something and that to the yeah, you don't view, you don't want a rectangle, so, right? Yeah, so that it's hard to. Look at what you're in the detail and, and see it in context with the rest. And that's where he was really pushing, well, not pushing, but, you know, the AR was really helping right now with, with that experience. I'm just curious about your experience because you seem to have a lot more experience with VR hardware. The, yeah, I mean, field of view would be nice if it was just full fit, full vision. Like, I mean, I, uh, I can argue a VR headset is full vision, but it's technically not, but it's enough. You don't need like, like the Pimax VR headset. It goes like beyond my peripheral vision. I can turn my eyeball and see there, but I can't actually see if I'm looking straight forward. So like, what's really cool though, is we're in this HMD arms race with VR and they're doing like the next gen of, of it will be eye tracking. And there's lots of benefits you get when you have a nice eye tracker because on the rendering side, our eyesight, uh, we defocus a lot of what we see anyway, because we're, we're using field of view, but in like an animal way, like our eyes aren't always in the same focal length and like stuff's out of focus, stuff's in focus, and we rapidly go between them. So if a computer can actually like keep an eye on that and like have that data available for the renderer, then you can actually build rendering applications where stuff in the app in the computer graphics is out of focus, just like eyesight. So they were trying to get to this like kind of realism threshold where like, you know, we'll look at digital content and it's out of focus in different distances. And then you also have to have a display that defocuses properly. So the, like a fighter pilot outfit, um, you have collimated light coming through the, 
the headset. So that means everything's in focus at all depths. And that's how computer graphics are in a, in a VR headset right now anyways. Everything's in focus out forever. So like if we have data about where you actually are looking, whether you're looking around or closer or further away, then you can respond. And then if the field of view isn't there, then it's, that, that doesn't help. But the point is the AR will benefit from these innovations happening in the VR space. And then I don't know. I don't know. Like these headsets will probably converge. Probably, you know, they'll have a nice headset that is a reasonable cost, but it has enough bells and whistles that you could do VR with it or AR with it. And Honestly, like taking back to watching the videos, you saw that my question never came to mind while watching your view from the, the view. It seemed normal. Yeah. Well, when the content has realism involved, like say if I'm actually going to render a clump of grass in front of you or like a miniature of your your uh, maquette, let's say it's like the mountains or something, it's like if that looks pretty realistic and the computer graphics are meshing with that, it would be nice if you could kind of get them together. The other problem is like the color black doesn't work in AR. Like it works for video through on a tablet, but if you're using a headset, the color black is basically 100% transparent. You know, it's like a projector. If you project on the wall, measure black, it's a, there's nothing showing up on the light meter. Question, Tassie. Yeah, so is transfer measuring gone up enough? If like, so I'll do my normal spiel, which is um, like, so a lot of people get sick of VR. They've actually had a recent trip to the void of Berkeley, there's the Netherlands, and um, it's like, way more prevalent in women than men. Mm -hmm. And so she did tests with people who were transitioning from female to male. And they actually show that the higher their estrogen levels were, the more they get sick in VR. Oh, wow. But actually, we do suck at it more. So is it better to have more frame rate, frames per second? Yes. OK. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, so VR right now is standardized at 90 frames per second. These are 60. And these are whatever the, the whatever the, like Apple, I think it mandates uh, around 60. I might be wrong about that. If Jeff Rogers is listening, he can correct me. And you uh, can practice how I know I'm better at it. But I mean, these you don't wear on your head. This one, these you do. I mean, you, this is where it's important. Um, the the dumb, like kind of the directive for this frame rate that Tassie's asking about is really just comes down to the manufacturing choices they've made as far as what hardware they're going to use. And the controllers for these displays are based on like little Pico projectors, you know, and um, light field emitters that are like over here in the side. And, and like, you know, when you miniaturize hardware, you get a limitation that seems old. So I think 60 right now is a nice sweet spot, but you're right, it should be 90 or more. Uh, I mean, t televisions are 120 hertz at Walmart for $100 now. So we need headsets that also go to 120 hertz. Once you go, once you go that far, you're dealing with other problems other than the refresh rate. I think there's, there's, a, there's a thing called persistence of the display. So like as a LED or LCD turns on and off with these refresh rates, it needs to actually in between those two frames be completely black or not be lighting up the screen at all somehow. Because they find that if you put an LCD in front of your face, when it flips through the frames, you're actually still emitting light in between those frames. And that'll cause people to get sick because you get this like kind of subliminal, subliminal like flashing that's happening because it appears like it's flashing, especially in dark scenes, because it's supposed to be dark, but you're still getting light, you know? So we're never, the displays they're using aren't necessarily meant to be in front of your face quite yet, but I'm excited for the next gens of a lot of these. <laughs> 1700 hertz? Yeah. Oh. Okay. I also find latency is not much of a problem in AR compared to VR because VR you're, you know, you're immersed and you don't really want the virtual world to like wobble or not, or come unlocked. Like if you have something that's somewhat laggy in AR, it's not as big of a deal because you still can anchor with the real world. That's, that's a win. You know, that's something you can kind of take to the bank and say, all right, latency is a little bit more forgivable. So, because I go to these VR conferences like IEEE and like, I mean, they're, they're still engineering lower and lower latencies trying to get to that really perfect spot and uh, it's unfortunate that that's still a problem but okay thank you all for coming great questions we're definitely over time but uh, i'm gonna let you go